Greetings once again from Hong Kong. Over the last two weeks, my focus has been on the cardinal virtues, as they are called in the Christian context. Last week, I discussed prudence, its meaning and implications. And in the previous week, I focused on fortitude. I'm continuing this theme today and we'll discuss the third cardinal virtue, namely justice. The point I've made in discussions of prudence and fortitude is that these are terms which are not in common usage these days because they run so counter to the ways of this world which tends to focus on the self as the centre of one's universe and a preoccupation with instant gratification. By contrast, the virtues of prudence and fortitude are rich Christian qualities that are the product of a God focus rather than a self focus and they're concerned with self-control and endurance rather than instant gratification. However, the virtue of justice differs from prudence and fortitude because the term is still in regular usage, so it's, sim it's a simpler quality to understand. Nevertheless, in common with prudence and fortitude, the Christian meaning of the term differs from the secular definition, such as that given in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the quality of being fair and reasonable. By contrast, the Christian description of justice as a cardinal virtue can be summarised as giving God and man what they are due or owed. Based on this description, let's first look at what it means to give God his due. In other words, what do we owe God? The short answer to this question is that we owe God everything. This answer is true for both Christians and non-Christians alike. And if you are currently a non-believer, I want to briefly explain why I make this claim with full confidence. We need to understand that God, not science, was responsible for the universe coming into existence. The Bible, in the book of Genesis, informs us that God created the universe and an open-minded investigation of the evidence indicates strongly that the Bible is an accurate and reliable document. This evidence confirms that the Bible we have today, in its many versions and translations, is an accurate translation of the original scripture and its contents, including the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ which have been confirmed in other historical documents and in many cases by archaeological discoveries. Now time doesn't allow me to discuss the evidence in detail, but those interested can refer to a set of three TLC world messages entitled Christianity, the One True Faith. Thorough investigation of the evidence the Lord purposely left for us to find will assure Christ followers or modern day doubting Thomases that the contents of the Bible are in fact God breathed as 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 tells us. The Bible is accurate and it informs us that not only is God the creator of the universe but that his love for mankind is so great that despite the sinful ways and rejection of him that is common in this world, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take mankind's punishment and provide a chance for each of us to come into a full and vital relationship with him. John 3.16 conveys the extent of God's love for us much better than I can. This is what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In the context of justice, logically, God, as the creator of the universe, cannot possibly owe anything to his creation. 
Any debt must be from the created to the creator, especially when we also take account of the fact that he sacrificed his son to pay the price for the sins of man. In other words, he owes us nothing and we owe him everything. So what does this mean in practice? The amazing thing about giving God his due, what we owe him, is that we are the beneficiaries. God does not need anything from us. So when we give him his due, the result is of benefit to us. For example, we owe him our faith, which is not just a vague idea of faith, meaning that we believe in God as a general, a kind of general high power, but it's actually believing every single one of his promises in the Bible. So how, how then are we the beneficiaries of this deep type of faith? The following promises from the Bible are, are examples that indicate just how we benefit from a total faith in him. Romans 8 verse 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Similarly, Jeremiah 29, 11 promises this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Finally, Romans 8, verse 39, tells us in the, the words of the Apostle Paul that nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The point here is that we owe him total faith and the result is that we receive hope that is beyond our present circumstances. We are blessed by giving God his due. We not only owe him faith, we also owe him obedience. And again, we are the beneficiaries. Here is one of the verses to prove it. John 8 verse 51 contains these words of Jesus Christ himself. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. In other words, our obedience to the instructions given by Jesus, who was fully man and also fully God, results in our spending eternity with him in heaven, as opposed to ending up in the company of Satan and his demonic forces. Furthermore, just as Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross for us, we owe him our sacrifice in one tangible way that this is worked out in this world is in the form of suffering. It's a fact of Christian life that the walk with God involves suffering. Jesus confirms this as a fact in John 16 verse 33 in the following words. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation but take heart I have overcome the world. The Apostle Paul has something to say about suffering in Romans 8, verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There are other verses that deal with suffering, for Satan is a reality that the, the Lord addresses too, but suffice it to say, that the obedient Christ follower, willing to endure suffering for Christ, will not only survive the attacks of the devil, which many who walk without Christ will fail to do, but they will actually benefit from the process by developing Christ-like character. Christ-like character enables the person exhibiting it to have an inner peace despite external suffering, and also places present suffering in context because this world is not the end. The ultimate prize is a place in heaven with Jesus Christ where there will be no more death or mourning 
or crying or pain, which we find in Revelation 21 verse 4. And of course, there are blessings on earth too. Faith, obedience and sacrifice are three dues that we owe to the Lord. And there are more, such as worship and prayer. However, time doesn't allow me to delve into everything that we owe the Lord. However, the point I wish to make is that our owings to God benefit us more than Him. As true to His nature, He engineers everything for our benefit. When we turn our attention to what we owe our fellow human beings on this earth, we can't separate this from the fact that we owe God our obedience. In other words, we need to act according to the example set by Jesus Christ when he lived in this world. This is because Jesus came to bring justice to this world, and this is reinforced by God speaking about his coming through the prophet Isaiah, given in the following words from Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout, or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. We also need to be obedient to the word of God regarding the exercise of justice towards others. Now let's look at the example of Jesus. There are many aspects of Jesus' conduct towards men that we could discuss, but there are two that I believe need highlighting in the context of this message. The first is commonly known as love your enemies, which to natural man seems contrary to justice, but nevertheless, it is Jesus' concept of justice. In Matthew 5, verse 44, Jesus states, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There are two aspects of Jesus' notion of justice that may explain his statement in Matthew 5 verse 44. First, we need to recognize that according to Ephesians 6 verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Most people in this world are not practicing Satan worshippers, but are the victims of Satan's manipulations. The exceptions are true Christ followers who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them to combat Satan's influence. Satan is continually looking to set those of the world, meaning non-Christians, against those of God, meaning Christ followers. We need to recognize that this opposition stems from Satan's manipulations, in other words, spiritual warfare. One aspect of loving our enemies is to see behind human action and recognize the source of all suffering and enmity. But then in a position to pray against Satan and his demons and pray for the deliverance of those who are in his grip. The second aspect of understanding Jesus' statement about loving your enemies is to focus on the need to pray for them. One aspect of this prayer is for them to be released from Satan's grip and the other as aspect is to refrain from gloating when they fall. Proverbs 24 verses 17 to 18 states this very quite clearly. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. 
What this tells us is that loving our enemies requires a God consciousness. That's an ability to see things from a spiritual rather than human perspective. It goes against our natural human inclinations, but Christ followers are often called upon to do just that. Loving our enemies, however, does not mean we have to cultivate their company. We do not need to deliberately give them further opportunities to hurt us. We are merely called to pray for them and not gloat over their downfalls, both of which constitute a loving response. The second aspect of Jesus' conduct whilst he dwelt on this, this earth was that he was no respecter of persons. He was prepared and often did rebuke those who held themselves in high esteem, such as the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And he also exercised his healing power on behalf of the rejects of this world, such as lepers. Now it's said that true justice is blind. And Jesus epitomized this idea. This is the model for Christ followers who also must be no respecter of persons in the sense that it's being used here. What about the word of God? Being obedient to the word of God when it comes to justice requires an examination of the use of the term in the Bible to gain its true meaning. The Greek word, the original Greek word, is dike, which can be translated as both justice and righteousness. However, I want to focus specifically on Bible references and versions that use the actual word justice to be sure that we gather the direct meaning. Psalm 37, verses 27 to 28 states, Turn away from evil and do good so shall you dwell forever, for the Lord loves justice. Quite simply, justice involves doing good things rather than evil things in this world. The question then becomes, what do we mean by good things? One answer is found in Exodus 23 verse 2. He says this, You shall not fall in with the many to do evil. Nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many, so as to pervert justice. Justice in this world requires that we refuse to go with the flow of this world when it means an innocent person is going to suffer. This is all about integrity, which seems to be a rare quality these days. The meaning of justice in the Bible can also be discovered by examining qualities which are commonly associated with this virtue. In Micah 6 verse 8, for example, we read, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Isaiah, Isaiah 1, 17 states, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, we have, He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Finally, Zechariah 7, verse 8 states, This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. These Bible verses indicate that the scriptural meaning of justice involves humility, mercy, compassion and loving kindness, especially to the underdogs the outcasts and the oppressed in society. It also requires an unwillingness to go with the majority when inju injustice is being perpetrated. As one would expect, given that the Bible 
is God breathed, according to 2 Timothy 3 16, that the Bible meaning is totally consistent with the approach of Jesus when he lived on earth amongst men. So let's summarize. Reference to the various definitions of the cardinal virtue of justice indicates that in the Christian context it means giving God and man what they are due. We owe God, our Creator, the one who sacrificed his son to save us, everything. However, he is such a loving God that when we pay what we owe, we are the beneficiaries. One central debt we owe him is obedience. And this means we need to follow the model of Jesus' behavior when he dwelt on earth, especially when we realize that he was sent here according to Isaiah 42 verse 4 to bring justice to the nations. Central characteristics of Jesus' notion of justice is that we love our enemies and pray for them, understanding that man's actions are generally the result of Satan's work in the spiritual way, where our target for enmity should be. Other aspects of Jesus' just behavior that are reinforced by the word of God are a willingness to speak out against injustice, possibly in the face of opposition from the majority, and compassion towards the underdogs in society. For the Christ follower, this is the model of justice that we are called to replicate. Given that this model was demonstrated by Jesus, who was fully man and fully God, and is reinforced by God's word in the Bible, and there is every reason to accept that God is our creator, I suggest that this model should also be investigated by those who are not yet Christ followers. In addition, the Christian concept of justice embodies the utmost in courage, integrity and kindness. And for that reason too, is worth considering as a model of behavior. For this purpose, or for the general purpose of getting to know more about Jesus and the Christian walk and lifestyle, I suggest that those who are not yet followers of Christ email admin at the little church world .org, where you will find every assistance to explore a journey towards Christ and heaven. Okay, well, I'll, I'll close now and wish you a blessed week. And I'll be back with you next time to look at the last of the cardinal virtues, which is temperance. So goodbye for now.